Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my midweek mystery series where today we're going to be talking about the sad, sad case of Little Miss Nobody, a Jane Doe from Uvapai County, Arizona, dating back to 1960. Here's your warning in case it wasn't clear enough from the thumbnail and the title. The Jane Doe in question here is a childhood. The likelihood is that this was a murder case. This video has all the information you would imagine that comes along with a story such as that. Do with that what you will. I know a lot of people don't like to listen to stories involving children, so please do click out if you don't feel comfortable. But if you do hang around to watch or listen, pay close attention as always. You never know what detail in a story such as this one will click with people and hopefully we can spread the words a little bit more and make us one step closer to finding out who this girl was. I hate that doe name, Little Miss Nobody, don't you? Like, Little Miss Nobody was somebody. Somebody knew her, somebody gave birth to her. For the rest of this video, I'm going to refer to her as just Jane Doe, but for the sake of titling this video, I felt like it was best to include the name by which she is officially known to save any confusion, so people know who and what case I'm referring to. Some more modern sources do refer to her as Jane Uvapai Doe, which is much better, but the majority do call her Little Miss Nobody. I'm not 100% sure why she was dubbed that name, it's hinted in a few sources that it was the reverend who conducted her funeral referring to her as Little Miss Nobody and the name soon caught on. That's even what she's referred to on her headstone as. Hopefully we can find her real name soon and she can be called that instead of Nobody. Also yes, my video viewers, we have changed backgrounds once again, I was filming in the lounge downstairs which is a lot more like aesthetically pleasing to look at but the echo was awful, I felt so sorry for my podcast listeners so I've decided to come up here and film in my office which is much less echoey but hasn't really got anything in it yet, I'm like I don't even have a desk yet, I'm just sort of doing my work on this weird nook in the corner but I've got to build my desk later today so hopefully next video we'll have another new background and that might be my desk, but we'll see. <laughs> Actually, I don't even think I've mentioned in one of my true crime videos yet that I bought a house, I've moved house, hence the difference in background, um, very exciting. But yeah, just bear with me for a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, whilst I try and figure out what the hell is going on with my background, where's best to film. Everything is still in boxes, we've been here for two weeks now and everything is still in boxes. So just bear with me. But anyway, let's get on with the story. It was the 31st of July 1960 when the partially buried body of a little girl was found by a Las Vegas school teacher called Russell Allen. The Prescott Evening Courier reported that Allen came across the half-buried body on the side of a creek bed on the old Alamo Road, one mile west of the State Highway 93. He was out there searching for rocks with his family. This was in Uvapai County, Arizona, not far from a place called Congress. I was going to call it a town, but I don't think I can do that. Congress is simply a census designated place that was once used for gold mining before becoming a ghost town and is now simply a retirement community for the nearby town of Wickenburg. I feel like that gives you an idea of how middle of nowhere this place was. Highway 93 at this time was the main route between Phoenix, Arizona and Las Vegas, Nevada. And so as you'd expect, it was a very well-traveled route. After his discovery, Alan called the local sheriff and the deputy to respond was Dan Jacobs who was stationed at nearby Congress Junction. He found a pocket knife nearby that appeared to be bloodstained but the Prescott Evening Courier wrote at the time that it had not been definitively tied to the girl's death. And as far as I can find, they still don't know today whether this knife was connected or not. The body was described as having been there for one to two weeks and was badly decomposed, which makes sense as she was out in the hot Arizona sun during the peak of summer. Decomposition would have been much faster. Jane Doe was wearing white or pink shorts and a blouse with a distinctive chain design. Her fingernails and toenails were painted red and nearby they found male adult sized flip flops that had been cut down to fit the size of her feet fastened with brown leather straps. There were indications that whoever buried this girl may have dug two other holes nearby before they succeeded in making one big enough to hold the body. An autopsy and inquest were ordered to look into the death and they were able to find out a little more about this poor girl. 
Although a lot of sources do differ in descriptions of Jane Doe's physical appearance, particularly when it comes to age range, I'm going to pull the information from Doe Network as that is generally pretty reliable. So Jane Doe was, is estimated to be between two to seven years old, which is a massive age range for a child. You change and grow a lot in those years. She was 3'5 to 3'6, new reports tend to say 3'6 whilst old ones say 3'5 and she was 50 to 60 pounds, so likely around 55 pounds, which I think could tell us something in regards to her potential age. According to babycenter.com, nowadays that is the average height of a four and a half year old girl. However, the average weight is only 37 pounds, so the weight is much lower than what is suspected that Jane Doe was. Girls tend to reach this range of 50 to 60 pounds when they're seven to eight years old. Of course, we're just talking in averages here. I was barely four foot when I started secondary school at 11 years old, so I know that not every child follows this chart perfectly, but you've got to go with averages in a case like this. The suspected height and weight of Jane Doe is interesting though, because she was a healthy weight or maybe even slightly overweight for the height that she was. If she'd been mistreated in life, not provided with enough love and nutrition, that probably would have reflected in her body, but that doesn't necessarily seem like it was the case. The likelihood is that this would have been a girl who was fed fairly well. Multiple sources do state that although that's the age range given at the time by forensic pathologists two to seven years old, investigators nowadays do believe that she was towards the older end of that spectrum, five, six, seven years old. We now know that Jane Doe was white, although at the time in the 1960s, the level of decomposition made it impossible to tell what her race was. And this probably would have affected the investigation in the early days. They were able to give the public very little in terms of description. All they had was this girl who was dead. She did have brown hair, but interestingly, it had been dyed to this auburn color. Her eye color was unknown and the only distinguishing marks or features they were able to find was the fact I mentioned before about her fingernails and toenails being painted bright red. She had no previous fractures and of course they couldn't tell if she had any birthmarks or anything like that. Again, the lack of fractures is interesting because a lot of the time when we're dealing with children who are abused, you will tend to find evidence of fractures on their bones. Not always, but a lot of the time. Jane Doe's dentals are available, she had a full and perfect set of baby teeth, her fingerprints are not available and we do now have her DNA, although we didn't for a very long time. Her cause of death was not able to be determined due to the level of decomposition and it was listed as undetermined yet suspicious and was officially declared to be a homicide. Something I've neglected to mention up until this point is that her remains were actually found charred. Investigators think that her remains have been burned one to two weeks before she was found, so likely very soon after she had died. I suspect that the perpetrator had attempted to dispose of Jane Doe's body in fire before realising that's actually quite difficult, so they then decided to find a desolate place to bury her. But they didn't even do a great job at the burial either. Everything describes her as being half buried, but she was found in a creek bed where the ground would have been soft and animals likely would have been digging. To me, all of this, along with the failed attempts to dig other holes nearby, suggests that this maybe wasn't a seasoned killer. In the months after Jane Doe's discovery, there was a lot of coverage of this case in the local Arizona press, but there were never any leads. Sheriff Jim Cramer and Deputy County Attorney George Ireland pressed the search on for months, following every shred of information that came in, hoping each one would be the one that led to answers. In November 1960, it was said that there was a good lead in Northern California that may establish an identity, and the sheriff travelled hundreds of miles by air and land following these leads, but nothing ever came through. Suspects and other crimes involving small children were questioned in connection with the case and the sheriff's office received dozens of letters, telephone calls and telegrams asking for information about this girl. Several times parents and relatives would come to the office thinking that she was their child but identification was always difficult because there wasn't much left of the body to identify. An APB broadcast was made over police and sheriff radios, local and state police during the search, even the entire resources of the FBI were used to no avail. 
At the time, the level of decomposition meant that even creating a composite drawing of Jane Doe's face was impossible, so they were literally working on nothing. In August 1960, officials started to explore the possibility that Jane Doe may have been a four-year-old girl called Sharon Lee Gallagos, who had been abducted from an alley behind a home in Alamogordo, New Mexico on July 21st, 1960, so just 10 days before Jane Doe's body was found. Sharon was four years old, Hispanic, with light brown hair and brown eyes and a birthmark on her right hip. I can make a whole video about Sharon's case in itself, but she was picked up by a man and woman in a dirty old green car, possibly in 1951 or 52, Dodge or Plymouth, and it's believed that she had been stalked for at least a week prior to her abduction. Sadly, Sharon has never been found. It made sense that investigators would consider her for Jane Doe. Although Jane Doe was found in different clothes and Sharon disappeared wearing, she could have been changed. But ultimately, the police would release a statement believing that Jane Doe was not Sharon. They ruled her out based on a footprint taken at Sharon's birth, and also on the basis that they initially believed Jane Doe to be older than Sharon, who was four years old. We'll get onto DNA testing later in the video, but I do believe that if it was Sharon, at this point we would have had an answer through DNA. In March 1961, they thought that Jane Doe could have been four-year-old Deborah Dudley, known as Debbie, who had disappeared from Virginia. In February 1961, they'd found the body of Debbie's seven-year-old sister, Carol, who had died from malnutrition after being neglected by their parents. That led them to believe that Debbie could have met the same fate and that she could be Jane Doe. However, Debbie's remains would later be found in West Virginia and so her name was ruled out entirely. Their parents would later be charged with both of their murders. It was initially thought that Jane Doe could have been the child of transients, and so they zoned in on a homeless family that would hitchhike often in the area and were known to have been in the Congress area in the month that Jane Doe was found. The father, Lester Davidson, was questioned by the police as well as two of his children, but they knew nothing and eventually the police had to move away from this area of interest. They focused on transients as this was the kind of quiet area where most people knew most people. Nobody knew of a young girl who had gone missing and being so close to the highway, it made sense that she likely wouldn't have come from this area. This did mean though that she could have come from literally anywhere else in the country, which as you can imagine, isn't all that helpful. An article from the Prescott Evening Courier dated August 10th, 1961, so now over a year since the discovery of Jane Doe, says law enforcement turned to television in an effort to get answers. Sheriff Kramer led a party of officers and a cameraman to film the location where the body was found, and later that day brought out evidence found at the scene, including the cut down to size flip-flops. Soon this film was shown on TV in the hopes that someone might recognise something about the crime and provide an answer. Kramer said to the courier, Somewhere there is someone who is the answer we have been looking for. Maybe this will be the thing that will bring that person forward. As you can guess, it didn't. Just over a week after Jane Doe's discovery, the local community, realising that she wasn't going to get her name, took it upon themselves to love her and provide her with a burial, not wanting her to be unceremoniously shoved in a box and lowered underground. At the suggestion of a local radio presenter, the community came together with people donating all the money they needed for a proper burial, and florists, cemetery operators and a mortuary provided all of the services needed for this. A Dr Charles Franklin Parker conducted the rites, and more than 70 people turned up at the funeral of this unidentified girl. Her card of memorial identified her as God's little child, date of birth unknown, date of death unknown. Dr Parker said at the funeral, we may never know the whys and wherefores, but somewhere someone is going to be watching the paper to learn what happened to a little girl left on the desert. If there has been a misdeed, possibly a disquieted conscience will go on and on. Jane Doe's casket was pale blue and adorned with flowers, with many more in arrangements on the ground nearby, and a headstone would later read, Little Miss Nobody, Blessed Are the Pure in Heart, St Matthew 5 8, 1960. The investigation has continued long since her burial, and for decades visitors have stopped at the grave to leave flowers and toys. 
This happened in 1960, 62 years ago. And as you know, a lot has changed over the years in terms of criminal investigations, techniques, and technology has changed, got more advanced. For years, this case hit a brick wall, but in 2012, local authorities entered Jane Doe's details into the NamUs database under the name UP10741. This meant that anyone, members of the public, as well as official investigators, could view the details of her case and compare her to information they had about missing children they knew of. And then in April 2018, the case was fully reopened with full force when the Uvapai County Sheriff's Office renewed their search, hoping that modern technology would finally provide some answers. Thanks to funding from the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, the Sheriff's Office were able to exhume Jane Doe's remains, her skeleton still intact. The remains were then sent to the University of North Texas Centre for Human Identification so they could obtain a DNA profile to be entered into these national databases, and then finally create a facial reconstruction through both the DNA and the skull. For my YouTube viewers, this is the facial reconstruction they made. For my podcast listeners, I would recommend giving it a Google and having a look. It was at this point that they gave a more updated profile of Jane Doe. Three to six years old, 55 pounds and three foot six. Her race was still undetermined at this point, but later pathologists were determined that she was likely a Caucasian female. The Uvapai County Sheriff's Office addressed the media following the release of the composite drawing, stating any detail, no matter how small, is important in the quest to determine this child's identity. In 2021, even more movements were made in the case when the amazing people over at Othram partnered with the Sheriff's Office to use advanced forensic technology in an attempt to identify Jane Doe. There was a page published on dnasolves.com on the 20th of January 2022, so literally about three or four weeks ago now, with a fundraiser to raise $5,000 towards the testing in this case. And the funding is already complete with a $1,000 donation from the Sheriff's Office itself. So that's fantastic news. I guess now it's just a case of waiting for DNA to provide us answers and or for someone to come forward with information. Othram are incredibly good at what they do, they've already found so many answers in unsolved cases, so I have 100% faith that they will get the answers in this case as well. But as we know so well, getting Jane Doe's identity doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get an answer as to her death. As Lieutenant Tom Boltz has said, hopefully we'll be able to if we get them identified. Through that familial database, they'll be able to call us and be able to tell us the background story on what happened to her and how she ended up out there. Now, I do tend to avoid speculation in videos such as these, as I think it's much more helpful just to stick to the facts. You don't want to lead anyone down the wrong path in terms of finding answers and getting them stuck on that when it could be something else completely. But there is something I want to explore with you guys in this case, and it's probably something you think I just brushed over earlier. The fact that Jane Doe's brown hair was dyed or tinted or burned, and the fact her fingers and toenails were painted bright red. I don't think this is a small point in this case, and I think it could potentially provide some answers. From the research I've done on the internet, reading about what other people think about this case, People who were alive in this time in 1960, the general consensus seems to be that children did not paint their nails and dye their hair, it just wasn't something that was done. Although of course, it's not impossible that Jane Doe's parents may have allowed it. But we'll operate under this assumption, this just wasn't a normal thing for a girl of this age at this time. Which leads a lot of people to lean in the direction of trafficking in this case. It's a possibility that her hair was dyed and her nails were painted in an attempt to make her look older to predators, in an attempt to sexualise her. It's also a chance that Jane Doe was abducted and her hair was dyed to disguise her, something which is commonly done by abductors. But this does raise the question of why an abducted child was not reported as missing. But then again, this was 1960, before modern technology would make communication between different jurisdictions much easier. Maybe she was reported as missing in a state on the other side of the country, and the connection was just never made. Maybe she has had family looking for her for the last 60 years. 
but that does sadly mean that older loved ones who would have known her will likely be coming to the end of their own lives now if they're still out there, which makes it even more important that we find her identity now. There's a chance that Jane Doe may have been part of a child trafficking ring, maybe instead of abduction she'd been given up or sold by her parents. Due to the level of decomposition of her body, there was no way to tell if she had been sexually abused or not. Two years before Jane Doe was found, on the 31st of October 1958, the body of another Jane Doe, known as Little Miss X, was found in Grand Canyon, Arizona, which is only about 120 miles north of Uvapai County. She was estimated to be between 11 and 14 years old, and her hair had also been dyed from brown to a lighter brown. Her hair was also said to be wavy, but they're not sure if that was natural. And like Jane Doe in our case, her teeth was also in very good condition, but she had a number of fillings. Little Miss X's cause of death remains unknown, but it was investigated as a homicide. They could be completely unconnected, but finding two bodies of young girls who were likely murdered within such a close distance in the space of two years is quite a coincidence. A lot of people on the internet do think they both could have been part of the same child trafficking ring. Other people speculate that the reason Jane Doe has been identified for so many years is because she was an illegal immigrant attempting to cross the border. For years it was thought that she may have come from nearby Mexico, perhaps her hair was dyed red by her parents who tried to get her over the border and the cut flip flops could have been the only footwear her parents could afford. These are things that could genuinely make sense if her family literally walked from Mexico over the border into Arizona. But I think this theory would have a lot more footing if Uvapai County was any closer to the border. According to Google Maps, Uvapai is over a 70 hour walk from the closest border. When talking about this theory, a lot of people think that Jane Doe just literally couldn't make the journey, that she died and her parents were forced to bury her en route, never coming forward for fear of deportation. But honestly, I just don't see why this would have been in Uvapai County. If I'm being ignorant to how far immigrants walk over this border, then please do let me know. Being from the UK, I'm aware there are certain nuances I can miss, so the comments are open but 70 hours away just seems like a lot. But also more recent DNA testing says that she was likely white, not Hispanic. So that does make the chance even slimmer. It definitely is a theory to bear in mind though, so I wouldn't discount it. This is an interesting case because if Jane Doe was part of a child trafficking ring or if she had abusive parents, she likely wouldn't have been in such good condition. She had a full set of perfect baby teeth. She was a healthy weight, if not a bit overweight, which doesn't point to her being neglected or malnourished. But she has never been reported as missing, which you would expect if she had been taken from loving parents. Hopefully, if they can find her identity, they can find further answers. It's been 61 years and six months since she was found, and I know there are answers out there somewhere. After exhumation, her body was reburied at Mountain View Cemetery in Prescott, where she remains today. Anyone with any information can contact the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, the Uvapai County Sheriff's Office, Cold Case Investigator John Shannon, or you can leave a tip anonymously by calling Uvapai Silent Witness and referencing Agency Case 1960. Of course, I will leave the details of each of these in the description box down below. This is a particularly heavy, a particularly sad Jane Doe case, but that makes it all that much more important that we hear about it and we spread the word and we try and do what we can to get her identity. I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on Othram for any updates on this case. I really, really hope that they can work their magic and come up with an identity. They are really doing amazing things and fingers crossed. We'll see. I'll keep you updated. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.